um, so I am looking here, and it looks like at least the people in the class are here. So let me do a little bit of a welcome and introduction. Um, uh, welcome to Inspire Me, and our guest speaker today is Tressa Daniels. She's the Global Director of Human Factors Engineering at Teleflex Incorporated, and I'm sure she'll talk a little bit about that. Um, she's been doing human factors engineering for 22 years, and um, she works with interaction design, um, ethnographic research, and executing human factors analyses of consumer and medical products, which is really cool. Um, and one of the things she's going to talk about is basically how do you put the human into the design um, so, so that you can uh, make things that help and not hurt uh, uh, people as they're working with your product. And how that dovetails in really well with mechanical engineering, uh, biomedical engineering, um, all, all of those different uh, areas. Uh, Tressa also has a degree in psychology, which um, I think is a very interesting piece because um, it's not just how people feel physically with interacting with things, but psychologically as well. So I'm going to turn this over to Tressa. All right. Thanks, guys. Um, I appreciate you having me, even though I couldn't be there in person. This is really great. I think it'll work out well. So um, just a little bit more background. So my main focus for the last 10 years has been on device safety for medical design. Um, and those devices could be anything from a continuous glucose monitor to an infusion pump at the patient bedside. It could be um, an auto injector, such as any type of auto injecting pen, pre-surgical work, um, surgical tools for clamping, um, at catheters, et cetera. So I've covered a lot of different things, including um, in vitro diagnostics machines for doing DNA sequencing and identifying different health related issues that are, are uh, hereditary. Um, so today I will cover basically what human factors is. For those of you who don't know, I just have a general overview of what it is. We'll talk about what use errors actually are and I have some examples of those. The FDA, fo FDA focuses heavily on different types of use errors, what leads to them and what they would actually expect your medical design to do to prevent those use errors. I'll cover some design principles and give you some examples of good and bad types of human factors designs that are not limited necessarily to the medical device industry. Um, human factors engineering is applied consistently among consumer products or medical devices and uh, any type of regulatory, a uh, regulated industry. I started off in aviation. So they also have human factors regulations that they need to follow. So just as a point of introduction, um, the whole point of a human factors engineer is basically to enable us to design a more usable, safe medical device or um, make it better user experience, make it more easier to use, intuitive, et cetera. So that's the purpose of this presentation. Um, the user interface would include anything that a end user would interact with. So a lot of people think that it's just the device. Um, it's just that, um, that hardware component, but it can be labeling, it can be packaging, any accessories that might actually be a part of that use. So for an example, an accessories could be um, uh, they, could, they could be disposables or consumables that your medical device is using. It could even be something like a backpack or a fanny pack. If you are a patient that has a infusion pump that is your, your mobile, you're at home, a home user, and you have to have infusions throughout the day, sometimes they're bolusing, sometimes they are just streaming to you constantly, you'll usually have to wear either a backpack or a fanny pack. That, those types of things are considered accessories to a medical device, and they can actually impact safety for good or for, or for worse. So if we find that during the use of a medical device, an accessory is causing a hazard to the safety of the patient, or perhaps it's preventing one, we focus on both of those areas. How is it preventing it or how is it causing it? And if it's causing it, what do we need to do with the design of either the product or the accessory to limit that issue, those hazards? 
Instructions for use are a big one. In fact, labeling and instructions for use, the FDA looks at heavily. So I have a couple of slides on, on instructions for use. Basically, what you'll need to do is make sure that your end user understands what they're reading. If they can't comprehend it, if it's not written at a certain grade level, um, it gets into some uh, complications with approvals with the FDA. Now with healthcare providers, we're lucky because most of them have a higher level education. But if you were to design this for home, home users or patients, you have to then write your instructions for use at an eighth grade level. So it's not just limited to the hardware, the software, the disposables. We literally have to look at everything that the user can touch. So how does this relate to systems engineers? Well, um, systems engineers are a really a great set of folks to work with in industry because they have a very holistic view of, of the product and how it interconnects with all of these different components. Whereas if you're a mechanical engineer, you may be defining the guts of that product. And that can actually impact ergonomics. Maybe it's heavy, maybe there's a thermal issue. We, you know, we've, had, we've seen a lot of issues where um, once we get everything in there, all the mechanics and the electrical por portions of the device, for example, an infusion pump, it overheats. So those are the thermal issues that we have to be careful about. We need to make sure that our users aren't going to get burned. Um, and then for the, bio, uh, the biomedical engineers, we study the, we work with those and study their patterns of behavior and use regularly. So biomedical engineers are really important because they're typically maintaining the devices in the hospital, fleet management, they may be cleaning and disinfecting these instruments, which is a huge focal point of the FDA. If you do not sterilize, what harm can come to the patient as far as in infections and other issues? So if we look at the definition of human factors engineering, it's a scientific discipline concerned with understanding interaction among humans and elements of a system. Um, we're really focused on designing usability into our product. That's first and foremost. We then want to test to make sure that it's not just in our minds usable. We never want to actually use ourselves as an example, but it's actually usable to our represented user group. So we go out and we, we test the product in prototype form with nurses, uh, hospital pharmacists, biomedical engineers, anesthesiologists are a big one. They are often the hardest group of doctors to recruit. Um, but we need them because there's certain aspects of an infusion pump specifically that only an anesthesiologist would be using. Um, rarely do we actually have to test um, with a, a, a doctor, a regular doctor, I should say, like a surgeon or an MD on an infusion pump itself. Typically that's limited to the nurses and anesthesiologists. Um, but we all we look at all of these distinct user groups and make sure that that one product works with all of them for all of their needs. So once we go through and we we test those products, we then recommend design changes based on those tests. So overall, the goal of human factors engineering is to really ensure that our patients, our users, they're safe, the system works, it's optimized, it's not causing undue confusion. And we often look at this fundamental question. So will the intended user of this medical device be able to use it first with these user interfaces? Plural, because it can be anything. Like I said, the labels on the product, um, the actual device itself. Is it working with uh, an EMR system such as Epic or Cerner? Is, it con is there connectivity between those two systems or multiple systems um, with these accessories? After receiving training, assuming that your users do receive training, and if they don't receive training in the real world, um, can they use it without that training based on just the, the um, instructions for use that you're providing with the product? We also look at the environment of use. So we'll design certain products a certain way based on temperature, lighting, noise levels, things like that. One thing that we focus a lot on in infusion pumps is alarm alarms, the decibel levels, uh, the frequency of the audio bursts. So we did a study where we looked at um, nurses and we measured their speed of walking through a hospital as they passed each patient door. Um, at that 
particular clip of a walk. If we had a high priority alarm on an infusion pump, would a particular nurse walking by that room be able to hear that within a certain amount of time based on their speed of walking? Um, we also look at visual alarms. You know, is is the is it clear that this particular device is in good shape? Is it working as intended? Or perhaps it's in an error state. Maybe it's paused. Um, those th types of things have to be visible from a certain distance. So we look at overall that environment of use, specifically to nurses in this in this particular example. The requirement from the FDA is they need to be able to see the status of an infusion pump from 12 feet away. Now they don't need to read the user interface of the actual device, but they need to know the status. Do they hear it or do they see it or both? Um, and what we're do, trying to do is after they've used this device with these interfaces, these accessories, after getting this training, can they use it in this environment? Will we be able to achieve certain results, which is basically, we do not want them to experience difficulty, confusion, inadvertent use error that could actually result in unintended harm to our patient or our user. So our user may be our nurse in that situation, but there's also issues with the patient. Um, and one thing to keep in mind, especially uh, on a patient floor where you've got not just the nurses, the doctors, you've also got the patients and the family members. We look at what type of emotion could we potentially elicit in a mother who has a baby hooked up to a medical device. Um, we don't want to elicit um, too much intense emotion with the, uh, with the part of the mother because what, what happens, it's this domino effect. If if the alarm goes off and it's too harsh, given the, the issue that the baby may be experiencing, the mother panics. The mother then finds the nurse, the doctor. It's everybody in a panic. So we look at emotional design and what level of priority should an alarm actually be getting. Maybe we want the mother to panic and go get the doctor. In some instances, we do. But in other instances, we simply need to make this something that the nurse recognizes that needs attention, maybe not immediate attention, but she does need to assess, assess the situation at some point in time. So what human factors is not, and what, what I'll see in a lot of product development life cycles at different manufacturers is they'll think it's um, something new, that, wow, this is new, we've never heard of this. It's actually not. Um, I mentioned earlier that I started out in aviation uh, human factors started in World War II back in 1944. There was an attack on an air attack on um, an airfield, and we had a bunch of American pilots running to jump in the first plane that they could get to. And one particular pilot jumped in a plane, looked down at the cockpit, and it was completely unfamiliar to him. So he was able to taxi back and forth up and down the runway, but he was never actually able to take off. So this, of course, did not get reported until after the war because this pilot was embarrassed. He thought maybe he had done something wrong. When in actuality, what had happened is someone, Boeing, Lockheed, whoever was doing these cockpits at the time, not only did they change the design, they didn't make it intuitive, they didn't test it with their end users, they didn't provide awareness training or education that this training had, this change, these changes had occurred. So it's definitely not new. We've been doing this for a long time. Um, in, in 2016, the FDA released a guidance document dedicated to human factors engineering. However, if you go back to their documents from years ago, their guidance documents always had human factors engineering, even since the late 70s. So it's definitely something that's there and the FDA is calling it out specifically as a requirement for a 510k approval or post market approval for your medical device submissions. Um, in other cases, we will see that product development teams put it at the very end of their life cycle where they look at it as a checklist. Um, it's not one test with one user and then you're done. You do have to make this an iterative process. Test over and over until you think you've got it right. Um, and then at the end, when you've got a production equivalent system, validate it. 
in a simulated environment. So you know that when it does go out into your market and it is in a hospital or a clinic, that it can be used effectively. Um, never use yourself as the model for how something should be designed. You are not one of your users and engineers, we tend to think a little bit differently. So the comments that you will get when you go out into the field, uh, sometimes they can be startling and you will think, I would have never thought of that. Um, other things that come to mind are some products need to be translated and localized. So I recently did a study in Spain no, sorry, Milan, actually, it was in Italy. And I had, I had the product translated. So everything was in Italian. And what I, the strings of translation that I had sent to our translation contractor that we had hired, um, they translated everything word for word. But on one of the error messages on the infusion pump, I said that you needed to get another clinician to witness this dose this dose change to this particular weight based patient. So typically this would be in a pediatric ward, the weight of the child very low and wanting to give a dose that may be going over the typical limit of that dose would require an additional clinician to sign off on that dosing. Um, I said clinician. Now how that was translated in Italian was doctor not nurse, not clinician, but it said you need to confirm with the doctor. So mid-test, the nurses were just outraged. We can't find a doctor. There is no way we're going to get a doctor to come in their busy time, their busy schedules, and confirm that this dose is okay. And I, I said, but I didn't say confirm with a doctor. And they said, it says right here on this user interface to confirm with the doctor. And I meant nurse. So those types of things, you've got to test those. Um, so something to keep in mind. It's not just a usability test. For those of you who um, don't know what a usability test is, uh, it's a one-on-one -on -one session with a user and a moderator. You're going through the product task by task performing that, gathering feedback, um, and the idea is that you're forming your design at this point in time. And um, it's also not just satisfying regulators. Although we have to satisfy regulators, it's not limited to that purpose. What we do do in human factors, and um, Justin mentioned earlier that I have a bachelor's in psychology, so psychology and engineering in human factors very closely related. So we're looking at all of these different human sciences, the socioculture, perceptual, cognition, behavioral, the physical components of the human body, and that emotional motivational state that we can get into when we see the way a design is. If you think about your favorite website, it's probably eliciting a positive emotion. And if you think about a website that you hate, it's probably a negative emotion. So ideally, um, what we look at is uh, sometimes even just perception of usability, because oftentimes if a user perceives something to be usable, it will be. So we also look at um, how we can match people's expectations of how something should work and make it work that way. So we do focus a lot on human behavior as well as the limitations of humans. Limitations often come into play when we have home users. Um, if you think about a patient population that may have arthritis in their hands, the design of the product has to take that into consideration. Their dexterity will be limited. It's not going to be the same as the rest of the population. So we do look at that as well. This is a diagram just showing sort of that sweet spot of where we have human factors, cognitive science and ergonomics. So I mentioned ergonomics coming into play earlier. We do have to look at size, weight, perhaps the height, angles of different screens. If the user can't see it, they can't reach a control. That's a problem. And all of that with design engineering, the biological sciences and the social sciences all overlap to create human factors engineering. I'll stop for a second and see if any of you have any questions at this point. No? Okay. I can only actually see four faces. So for those of you I can't see, if, speak up. If you guys have questions, feel free to raise your hand in the participant window and I'll get you on here. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. Oh, uh, All looks right. like Yvette has a question. Oh, great. Yeah. So can you um, talk about... So when, you know, there, 
usually there's a bell curve to what the average person would be. Who are the actual entities that design those for human factors? So say, you know, you're designing some kind of device, there's kind of a, you design to a certain proportions versus whatever the statistical variance, who's responsible for designing that? And how often does that get iterated? Because people are changing, people are growing and vice versa, just. Yeah. So that's a good question. So typically that would be the responsibility of a human factors inter, uh, engineer via the help of an industrial engineer or in, um, a, in an interaction designer, depending on what type of product you're designing. Now, who we design for goes back to when we identify our intended user group, we then look at, at that. So nurses, doctors, we would, from an ergonomic perspective, we'd have to design the hardware or even software, but mainly hardware for the fifth to 95th percentile of the population. Home users, um, we also look at that and there may be different user groups, home users. So we have um, geriatrics, we have the typical adult population, we have pediatrics and the FDA breaks down pediatrics into four different types of unique user groups depending on their age. So um, that can also impact um, ergonomics as far as hand size, force, grip, the ability to actually function and, and control an actual device. Um, we also based on, on their age um, and even you know when we get into the geriatrics, we, we do have to look at um, cognitive disabilities in, in some way. Uh, so we do have to look at that. Um, it does really depend on the intended user population. Now, when we look at just nurses and doctors, we can typically say from an ergonomic standpoint, it's fifth to 90th percentile. From a reading level or a comprehension of perhaps the instructions for use or labeling, we wouldn't have to limit ourselves to that eighth grade reading level. We can then assume that um, nurses would potentially be, and for lack of a better word, the lowest common denominator. We know that the nurses are at one level of education and they're the, they're the base user group. From there we go, we have doctors with anesthesiologists, et cetera. So if we can design the product to fit the comprehension of the nurse, we can then assume that the doctors, anesthesiologists, surgeons, et cetera, can also understand those directions for use. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you. Tressa, uh, we've got a, uh, a question from Dr. Fitzpatrick, one of our biomedical faculty. Oh, great. Tressa, um, I had a question about implicit bias. Like, is that, a f is that something that you think about in terms of design and how do you, how do you try and offset or alleviate that? Sorry, what kind of device do you cut out? Um, implicit bias. Oh, implicit bias. Ah, okay. So let's see here. We deal a lot with, um, and I may not, I may not be answering your question the, the right way. So I wouldn't say that we specifically talk about implicit bias. However, when we recruit our user groups, we, we look at the different types of methodology. Um, we never retest our employees. Um, we do look at testing users of competitive devices. Um, a lot of times we'll do single blind studies so that uh, our particular user group won't know who the manufacturer of this device is, partly because there may be a transference of either a positive or negative emotion about the, the manufacturer, and we don't want that to impact our test results. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think that was that was sort of half, half of it. The other half was I was thinking about some of the uh, the design for for uh, for automated taps where water comes on and off, and so there was one example where they designed it like all of the designers were you know Caucasian, and so they own they didn't work for any other races. So that, <laughs> that kind of thing as well. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, we do. We look at different cultures. So um, and also we look at hospital policy. So um, I don't. I mean, I love Boston. But I don't like Massachusetts because the hospital policies are different than anywhere in the country. I hate testing people from Massachusetts because it throws off everything that we thought was correct. Um, but we do, we have to take that into consideration. So oftentimes we'll test, if it's just a US product and I'm a global director, so I look at every country that we support, which is uh, all of Asia, Israel, all of these different countries, um, 
and Europe. So, but in just in the US, let's just focus there, we'll test different regions of the US. So we'll test in Portland, we'll test in, in Arizona, LA, we'll go to Boston, we'll go to Denver, Miami, Houston, because we have to make sure that our mental model of how it all works around the country works for every place. And typically we have two outliers and that is Switzerland and Massachusetts. And these two places have very different hospital policies that their employees are expected to follow. So we have to work around that in some way. And sometimes it's changing the default setting. So when we manufacture and ship a product, we know it's gonna to go to Massachusetts. We know it's gonna to go to Switzerland, change the default settings because their hospital policy wouldn't use it as it's currently set up. All right, I'm gonna go on to um, why design can lead to use there. And first of all, what USERs are. So basically a USER, um, it basically refers to a situation in which the outcome of a device use was different than we wanted it to be. So if you look, think of it from a medical device perspective, it can be dangerous if somebody commits an error. Now, if you just click the wrong app icon on your iPhone, not a big deal. You can easily get out of it. It can be undone. But if you do the wrong thing mid-surgery, um, I just evaluated a product um, for coagulation during during surgery. And, and part of the issue was is that they were heavily relying on the surgeon to block the suction with their thumb. And so the accuracy of that was difficult because if you look at the ergonomics of a thumb and then you look at the suction hole in this actual coagulation uh, suction tube, the problem is, is that, that it has to be completely covered and pressed. And if you have either too big of a thumb and it didn't fit in the actual indentation of the size given for that thumb, you're not gonna get a full, a full press. If you have too small of a thumb, you may lead, leave open a gap. So that full suction is not gonna take into effect. So the expectation is that every thumb would be able to use the suction for coagulation, but uh, it's not necessarily the case. So um, these little mistakes that we may see in a um, consumer product, they're big mistakes in, in medical device design. Um, Oftentimes these use errors are due to a poor design. That was something that could have been mitigated and identified very early on if the designer would have taken into account the fifth to 95th percentile and perhaps even not relied on a human thumb to block it. Uh, maybe there needed to be another mechanic uh, put into place where they closed the hole with an actual apparatus. So the idea is that if your de medical device is designed well, you're gonna eliminate that use error and at the end of the day, create a safer product that of course would be much easier to get approval through a regulatory body. So death and use errors. So John Hopkins released a study back in 2018. Medical error in, is the third leading cause of death in the US. So this is why there is such a heavy focus on safety and ease of use, effectiveness of use, et cetera. So in 2018, the number was at 251,000 deaths because of medical device use error. Now other reports have said it's as high as 440,000. Um, so that's debatable. It just could be that they're not being reported. And you know, why would you want to report a, a use error? It's, it, people don't want to call a 1-800 number and say, I may have killed a patient because of a, of a use error. Oftentimes the, um, the, the medical device professional, excuse me, the medical professional will blame themselves for the death when in fact it was a design flaw in the actual device itself and it had nothing to do with their use or use of the actual product. It was a deficiency in either the manufacturing of the product or the design. <clears throat> so if we look at um, safety and effectiveness, that's the overall goal. Um, now they are opposite sides of the same coin in that a medical device is considered effective when it does what we want it to do. So it's providing the intended diagnosis, the intended treatment or a monitoring function. Um, a medical device is safe when it doesn't do what we don't want it to do. So it doesn't cause harm to the patient, the caregiver, the facility, the environment and the like. So what's interesting is a lot of people forget that um, medical devices can actually cause harm to a facility. So we do a lot of testing in labs. One particular test about a year ago uh, um, was testing a medical device in the verification lab. 
and the medical device caught on fire. Um, don't worry, it's not released. <laughs> <laughs> it caught on fire and the person doing the testing just out of sheer reaction, grabbed the device and threw it against the wall in the lab, which then lit the lab on fire. So we just really do not want damage to our facilities to occur either. Um, then if we get into the idea of when we design something, there's a famous saying, it's easy to make things hard and it's hard to make things easy. So when you start looking at the design of products, what can you do to simplify them? Um, we get a lot of stakeholder opinions when we're in product design. And if we were to throw all of those opinions and requests and wants into one product, we would get the image that you see on the right. Now, if we take what our users actually need to perform the task that they're actually needing to get done, you'll get the image that is on the left, which is clearly much more simple, much easier to use and a little bit more intuitive. Um, there's a few medical devices out there that do require two-handed use, and I'm, I'm just evaluated one last week saying that this two-handed use is unacceptable because it's going into the human body down the, down, um, the esophagus, and because of that two-handed use, it's not stable enough, and it would actually it would actually promote tissue damage in, in the patient. So they're going to have to come up with a different design that either has a mechanical component that would stabilize that while it's in the human body, or they're gonna to need to redesign it completely so that they could have one-handed use of the product. This image on the, on the right is clearly a two-handed use, and I could see getting cut pretty easily using it that way. Um, so I'm a huge fan of Dilbert, and one thing that we'll see product uh, engineers want to do is this. So your user requirements include 400 features. Do you realize that no human would be able to use a product with that level of complexity? Good point. I'd better add easy to use to the list. So this happened to me at um, a company that I used to work for in in vitro diagnostics. Keep in mind, I was the only human factors engineer at the company. And the CEO went on live finance TV. I forget the station. Anyway, and he said, Oh yeah, our product will be out in six months and it will be the easiest to use product on the market. So I grabbed that CEO the following day and I said, um, so I don't know if you realize what easy to use actually means, but given that I'm your only engineer, I only have six months and we're only in the prototype phase, I need some, some funding to hire about six more human factors engineers to make sure that you are holding good to your word now to the, the stock market. Um, so he did. He gave me a, a huge budget. I hired a huge team of people. And it, in fact, it is released and it's a really great um, in vitro diagnostic product. But, you know, these you know, folks in our leadership teams and, and our project managers, they always will just say, well, just make it easy to use. But easy to use needs to be measurable. What does it mean? Does it mean that it's fewer steps? Does it mean that um, it's it's shorter time on task. What does it actually mean? And people need to learn to figure that out. Now, when we look at users, we typically categorize them by perception, cognition, or action. So this is again where the psychology of human factors engineering comes into play. So a perception a perception error would basically involve a failure where you didn't actually see, hear, feel, touch smell, taste. It's, it's basically your five senses. Whereas a cognitive error is something that would fall into like a, if, an issue with memory. Maybe it's a rule-based failure where your design isn't following an industry standard. ISO has some guidelines that they expect you to follow for labels and IEC. All of these different regulatory bodies expect you to follow industry-based standards for certain types of medical device design. And the last could be knowledge uh, failure, where uh, you just don't really know how to do it. It's a misapplication. And that could be because of a generally accepted rule is not followed. Um, but basically, the knowledge base is you're misinterpreting. So you're improvising. And that can cause a lot of issues. The action base goes back to your ergonomics. They can't reach something. Um, they don't have the strength to turn a knob. Those types of things can all fall within that. So this just gives a picture of a couple of, it's, this is the actual use environment. 
you've got the nurse and you've got the patient. And it's basically showing that if we were to run a usability test with an insulin pump injection device, and we could, we could look at this from a, different, a few different perspectives. So first of all, is the user going to um, give the right dose or would they round up? And if they round up, that may be that they misread something or they, um, if they, they might also um, not understand something. A lot of times with these types of devices, the, the instructions will be on the actual label. Maybe they misunderstood it. So there, the cognition is a problem. And then action-based, perhaps either the, the injection, the, the button to press it was too easy to press, so they accidentally uh, pressed it, or it was too difficult to press, so the force, was, the force required was too much. So we look at all those different types of things. Any questions at this point? Okay. I'm going to quickly go through some design principles that we take into consideration. First one is attention. We know that attention is limited. It must be selective in many cases, and dividing attention can actually cause a lot of difficulty in use error. If we look at the environments that our medical professions work in, it can be chaotic, it can be loud, um, it can be dark. So we have to look at those different things that are causing a diversion in our different intention, uh, attention. So what we try to do is we make things a little bit more conspicuous. In our product design, what do we want them to focus on? Is Should we make it flash? Should we make it move? Maybe we should change the color. I worked at Hewlett, Hewlett Packard for a long time and designing the internal mechanics of the printer, we always had action blue. So anything that was blue was drawing attention to the user that they could touch it, they could turn it, they could press it, they could switch it, whatever that may be. So we look at these different types of things to draw attention to the most important components of our product. We also wanna make sure that when we're looking at labeling that they can actually see the text. Um, what's the durability of the text if it's on a product and that product is being used, it's then being cleaned and wiped down. Uh, what's, the, what's the lifespan of that label? Um, humans typically process top down and left to right. So if we look at this example where we have ABC on the front, but then if you were to put it, uh, sorry, on the first line, then you have 12, 13, 14. You never want to um, create something that could be mistaken for something else. If you're relying heavily on context of use, that could lead to inadvertent use there. The other thing to think about when you're designing products, and it could be hardware or software, is the proximity of controls. Typically our mind as a human, if controls are close to one another, we think that they're related. If they're further apart, we think they're not related. So if we take a look at some of these different design principles, we can apply them to uh, these designs and reduce errors overall. So there are a bunch of design principles out there. I'm going to focus on 10. Um, we often call them heuristics or design principles. They have been proven to reduce use error. Um, and they're really basically a summary of a lot of knowledge, a lot of research that has come out over the decades of, of this type of research that can actually show where poor design exists and how we can make the design better. So we use these design principles to evaluate products that are already done, and we use them to create products that don't exist. So here's the first five. We have recall versus recognition. Like I said, we don't want to rely heavily on someone having to remember something. We have affordance, which is indicating from a design perspective what the user could actually do with that control. Do they push it? Do they pull it? There's error prevention, meaning make sure that your design doesn't even allow for error. And if it does, make sure that uh, when we get to number eight, it will say error recovery. So if you can't prevent it, at least make it recoverable. Relying on instructions can work, but if you are a nurse on a patient floor programming an infusion pump, what's the likelihood that you have that, that manual with you? And then think about the lack of confidence you're instilling in the patient and the family members watching you look up in the manual how to program an infusion. Um, make sure that you use industry standard patterns. There's a lot of patterns out there that you can find on the web. We have regulatory guidances. Um, the HE75 is highly and heavily used for human factors engineers on all types of, of design, both mechanical 
uh, biomedical ergonomic based. So that's a really good reference. Make sure that you're reducing the cognitive load. So don't put too much. Don't make it that uh, Swiss army knife on the, the right side of the screen. Um, Gestalt principles, again, we get into grouping, proximity, and similarities in your device design and how they might go together. I've already mentioned error recovery. Uh, labeling IFU training experience, I'll touch on that a little bit more later. And lastly, remember that you are not the user. So I have a few examples here of the first one, recall versus recognition. If you see the way this software is set up, it's great because you don't have to recall what you have opened recently. You can just see it. It's right there in your most recent open files. Um, now, medical devices require that you always label your icons or your symbols. So here in the upper right, this is a perfect example. Here on the lower right, not as great of an example. Now, this isn't a medical device, so it's not too concerning. But medical devices do require a label. And people that translate their medical devices into 16 different languages hate that. So they're always trying to get by with just creating an icon or a graphic that communicates what they need. This one is a medical device. And if you look at the one on the right, it's really obvious where bolus is. Where's, where's my feature or function for bolusing? It's right there. In the middle, you can see that it, it's bolusing right now, but the one on the left, I don't know, maybe it's that little wave icon that's the bolus feature. I'm not sure, so I'd have to guess. And if I'm administering a bolus to myself, I don't know that I wanna guess. So that one is the poor design. It's not labeled, it's not clear, may or may not be using the ISO standard for bolus. So there's a lot of issues with that one in particular. Now affordance is basically, it shows you how an object uh, should be engaged with. So a cognitive affordance would be a clear unambiguous label. A physical affordance might be the button size and location. It's showing you physically that it's a button. And then the sensory affordance might be text size, font size, color, background, contrast, the things that we just covered. If we look at these examples, you'll see it's very clear that these should be switched, rotated, pressed, et cetera. Um, the, the photo in the lower right, it's not so great. There's no labels. There's all of these different, the, all of these different functions that have the same shape. So a lot of times we'll look at the the aviation industry. And if we look at the cockpit, we'll see where how things are grouped, how they're approx pro approximately located to one another. <clears throat> a lot of times in a cockpit, certain types of functions and features will be shaped a certain way so that the pilot does not have to look down. They can feel their way to what they want to do. Now, error prevention. Um, there is a famous study that was, um, that's been written up. Um, there's a book called Set Phasers on Stun, and it was actually based on this radiation therapy device. In 1985 to 1987, five deaths occurred because of an incorrect key sequence. So basically, this is radiation therapy that can be applied in a high and low dose. Um, the, the technician Basically, what she had done is she, first of all, she did an incorrect key sequence. And then when she tried to undo it, she did it too quickly. And the system didn't recognize the undo process. So the patients ended up receiving 125 times the normal dose of radiation. And five of the six patients that received this actually died. So this is a type of thing that this particular um, this particular device did, didn't really give away to prevent this error. She knew that she'd made a mistake and she tried to correct it. But the problem was, is the system wasn't optimized and she corrected it almost too quickly. And they had never done any verification test of how, what the response time would be to that self-correction. Relying on instructions is great because if you have a home care device that has instructions, you know it will be used. On the other flip side of things, it can't be great because like I said earlier, you don't wanna have a nurse referencing a, a user manual while they're programming an infusion pump. So we've seen a couple of things with home use products. When you do provide these clear step-by-step -step instructions, people do follow them and they do have a higher success rate. So they actually can give you um, a really good idea, idea of how to perform a task. Uh, my daughter used to have a peanut allergy. So um, I used to always have this EpiPen. 
and carried around everywhere with me, made sure that teachers have it. There was one in my glove compartment, one in my purse, one in the diaper bag. Um, everybody had one. And they have some really good written instructions on their device. Now, over time, a friend of mine, his name is Evan Edwards and his brother, Eric, um, developed the AviQ. And Eric and Evan, are interesting pair, identical twins. So it always throws me off when I see them and hear them. They sound alike too. Um, so Eric is a physician and Evan is an engineer. And they grew up with really, really bad allergies to everything, tree nuts, everything you can imagine that would send them both into anaphylactic shock. So as they finished their degrees in um, medical and in engineering, they both decided to come up with a better solution. The AviQ is the one of the best products I've ever seen. Now I've I've seen Evan's development life cycle. It's six years. It took him six years to develop, test, validate this product. Now the interesting about the AviQ is that it has auditory instructions. So if you are in a dimly lit environment and you can't see, it's telling you out loud what it wants you to do, when to do it, and how long to do it. It's an amazing device. Now, because it is their user groups went all the way down to age seven. So they had to test a group of peds. Um, when they brought in these seven years old, seven year olds into a usability test, the first thing when you take off the cap of this AviQ, it would say, if you're ready to inject yourself, press on your thigh for 10 seconds. And every kid, no way I put the cap back on. I'm not ready to inject myself. So they had to change the order of instructions because the first thing a seven-year-old thinks is, I'm not sticking a needle in my leg, are you insane? And so they had to go through this whole process of changing the way they worded these instructions so that a child would follow them. Um, they then, and, and as part of that effort, they uh, created a, a parent group who helped identify the labeling and the instructions for you. So I was part of the parent group who identified things on their labels that I found startling and unnecessary as a mom. I don't need to know that. I don't want to know that. So I said, listen, if you're trying to reduce emotion in an already stressful environment, take the, this, this word out. I mean, we don't need to know that. For legal claims, put it in your instructions for use that are off label of the product. But as a mom, I don't want to know that. I just want to know how to apply this. So that was a really good example of a very well done medical device. This on the other hand, relying on instructions, this is a problem. So they basically um, attached or connected an oxygen tube to a needleless IV port. Now this could have been done, this could have been fixed through design. We have things called forcing functions that actually would stop a user from making a connection, male to female, female to female, they cannot connect. So this was a fail when it came to, they were relying on instructions for a user to know not to do this. Clearly it's a patient bedside, they're not gonna have those instructions. The labeling wasn't sufficient on the actual tubing. So that, that did not go so well. Another thing we look at is patterns. So anything in the real world, when we design it into our products, try to use that as a learning transfer transference. It helps with speed of use and user retention, and it can really help um, decrease use error. I mentioned cognitive load, again, with the Swiss Army knife. Try to do as few features as possible. Be minimalist whenever you can be. We've talked a little bit about the Gestalt principle of proximity. This next photo gives a really good example of how in the older stove, the top controls, I have no idea which burner it goes with, but on the right photo, you can see exactly which knob goes with which burner. Error recovery, undo is always great. I mentioned in the Therac 25 study, there, there was there technically was an option to undo, but it hadn't been verified in testing, so it didn't actually work. So make sure that you help your users recognize that they committed an error, how they diagnose that error, and how they can recover from it. Now, training and experience is an interesting one because a lot of our medical devices could, in fact, require training. And in some cases, we, uh, we can assume that they've gotten this training in med school. Um, or in nursing school, but in other cases, maybe it's a brand new product in the, in the market and they haven't received on that. But if you rely on training too much, 
there's nothing any amount of training can do to fix a counterintuitive design. So while you can give some training, you have to assume a couple of things. First of all, the retention of training is really low, maybe 10 to 20% that they'll retain. So your device still needs to have intuitive features so that they can recall their training while it's in use. We've talked a lot about the labeling in IFU. Whenever possible, do not rely on it because it's, it's going to be very ineffective if it's not available. So follow the ISO standards. Make sure that you have labels on your symbols. Um, check that durability of the label and make sure that you've tested the comprehension of your written materials with your intended user. And lastly, um, do not test yourself or your classmates, unless it's just for a project in school. But um, if you're actually releasing into the market, don't use yourself as the example. Just a couple more minutes uh, to cover the FDA considerations. They expect you to focus on a couple of things. First of all, your design should be inherently safe. So you need to make sure that your design is safe as much as reasonably possible. They call it a Lara, a low, as low as reasonably achievable in your design, you need to get it to that point. If you get to a point where now there is nothing you can do with your design that wouldn't actually cause an expense to the market, like you need to get this life saving device out, uh, there's nothing you can do. Or if you did change the design, it could potentially cause more hazards, then you need to put protective measures in place, meaning alert messages or flagging test results that could have error conditions, safe valves, um, you know, visual or acoustic alarms, all those types of things. And lastly is the information for safety, which that goes back to your labeling, your directions for use, all of these things that they don't really want you to use, but they know that in some cases you might have to. So basically um, what I always uh, think about is going back to that minimalist approach is a designer knows he has achieved perfection, not when there's nothing left to add, but when there's nothing left to take away. So that is that. And I know there's only a few minutes left, but I'm happy to stay over if you guys have questions. Thank you, Joanne. <laughs> <laughs> so does anyone have questions? That was a lot of stuff in a short time. <laughs> uh, okay, Claire has a question. I have a quick question. Um, I'm sort of a, I'm a computational person. Uh, so you were talking a lot about device design and all that kind of thing. Do the same principles apply to software, to rolling out like new software and that kind of thing? And do you do much work in that? Yes, I do both software and hardware. In fact, a lot of my previous experience is in um, creating um, pharma, hospital pharmacy software. So. You know, an IV, an IV pump is great, but it doesn't work without the back end stuff. It's just a brick. So without that software uh, that the pharmacy is, the pharmacist is using in their lab, um, they're building out the drug library or the data set that populates all of the dosing and concentration and drug lists that you, that the nurse would actually then see on the um, pump side. But the thing of it is, is um, the pharmacist is responsible for setting limits. So you can have soft limits where a nurse could potentially override that dose, but your hard limits, the pharmacist is putting in saying, you're not, <clears throat> you are not gonna override this. It's, you cannot give any patient more than this amount. So in some cases, the pharmacist software is actually more critical than the pump itself because it really stops a nurse from making a use error of over or underdosing a patient. So all of that is considered medical device software. It populates, it connects to an actual hardware device. And we do a lot in that. And also for biomedical engineers, because they're calibrating devices, we need to make sure that their software is um, easy to use. It's going to give the right result at the right time. Great, thank you. Other questions? Well, I kind of feel like I have to ask this in the light of so many things going on, uh, ventilators and masks. And do you see that after all of this, when we're on the other side of it, that you might see a redesign in some of the things that nurses and doctors are wearing and using and all of that, um, just based on this, these last few weeks or months or Whatever. Um, you know, that's a good question. And, and, and unfortunately, I think this COVID thing has impacted everyone everywhere. 
Um, I don't know if it would result in a redesign, but what it might result in is some level of flexibility around uh, the FDA. So for example, they have the emergency use application, right? And companies are using that every day to get through a fast process with the FDA. We're using it at Teleflex. Um, so I think what might change is process and procedure a bit. Um, they're gonna have to do something else, especially when it comes to human factors engineering. Right now I have three products that are literally life-saving products. I can't get them validated with my surgeons because I can't access those surgeons. These people are now on the front lines. They're now exposed to the virus. I can't get a moderator who would want to go sit next to a physician right now who's been exposed to the virus. So they don't want to do face-to-face um, one-on-one -on -one usability testing or validation with that product. So I was on a call with the FDA last week and I said, listen to me, we, I, I get that COVID is number one priority, but we've got patients out there that need these procedures done. And that's not going to change because we have this virus. We have three life-saving devices that our surgeons need. You need to give me another option. If I can't go out, if I can't access, access a surgeon to have them actually use this product, then I need to do a remote validation test. I need to ship the surgeon the product. I need to do this on video, watch them use it. And, and go through that. So recently I had, um, <clears throat> uh, so it was for, it's for GERDs, right? So there's this, 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 this tool and I needed to, to do what we call a heuristic evaluation on it. And it's basically looking at where are the potential possibilities of use are. Now it's in the market, right? But so that was easier because it's already been released. But what I did is I shipped it to some users and what they did is they videoed using their iPhone and then they sent me their very colorful videos of, of all of the issues that they were having. So I was able to do a human factors evalu evaluation based on that alone, but take into consideration that that would probably not fly in an FDA submission as the only way of gathering input. They, they want a full blown validation. Um, and that doesn't count. So, you know, they're asking for industry people to provide best practices. So I had a call this morning with some of the other folks in industry and we're, we're coming up with guidance for the FDA. Typically the FDA guidance comes from us. So for example, the human factors guidance, it came from us, We, you know, the HE75, um, it came from industry, we're writing it, but you know, a, a different organization is publishing it and we're getting co-authorship. So the one thing I will say about the FDA is they do come to us when they need help. And just last year, I, I and two other folks in industry wrote a guidance document for them just so they could get it out because we need it. So if they're not gonna give us the guidance, we'll give it to them and they can publish it. Other questions? Okay. Well, Tressa, thank you so much. This has been really informative. And, sure. And, uh, and kind of exciting because I like, I like thinking about not only the mechanisms that we would deal with, but how people are going to use them. Right. Um, for the students who are in the 315 class, uh, your writing assignment is going to take the the things that you've heard Tressa talk about as far as uh, usability and the, the different factors that they're looking at. Um, she works with medical devices, but I would say pick something from your household, your kitchen, your garage, whatever, and look at um, the, the factors that go into that. Are they easy to understand? Are there safety factors involved? Are there things that people have to take into account with weight or the ability to grip or something like that, whether it's a blender or a chainsaw or something like that, pick an item and just kind of go through it and sit and, and look at it from that fact, from that uh, viewpoint and take a look and say, where has the manufacturer, the designer taken into account that a, a person has to use this? And that's what we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have you write on this week. Okay. Well, everybody, thank you so much, Tressa. If everybody give an applause to, to Tressa for being here. Thanks, everybody. Yay.